milk. Yeah, guys, there's uh, milk from the uh, Citadel Trivia. Just wanted to say hi to everybody. And uh, basically wanted to talk about uh, basically the natural history of Winterfell. I'm not here to disprove any theories yet. So uh, we can hold off on the super volcanoes later. <laughs> it, it, I don't know, unless Johnny really, really wants to ask about it, you know, during the presentation. But it's really more about the uh, about the geologic history of Winterfell, how it formed, and what we can gain from the types of rocks that are built there, the, uh, the presence of caverns, and basically the presence of hot springs. Uh, I did this uh, same kind of presentation about maybe 10 months ago, so you know, I figured it was time for a rehash since we did the Doom of Valeria uh, presentation last week. Let's just go ahead and finish off part two on this uh, geology series, if you will. And we all know that everybody loves the Stark, so it's, of a, it's a matter of interest to a lot of people. Um, anyway, to get started here, I uh, just want to acknowledge the same people as we did in the uh, Doom of Valeria talk. Uh, basically, Miles Trier, the guy from Stanford who uh, did a lot of work on building some these geologic models of Westeros and Plantos. Uh, Dallas of Ice and Fire blog. Uh, basically, still a couple pictures from uh, their blog and, of course, various web sources uh, for figures uh, who shall remain nameless because I have no idea who did them. And uh, here's the picture of basically Stannis getting ready to fight the Battle of Ice. You know, that's going to hopefully occur in Winter's of Winter uh, before I die. And uh, the other picture is just a bunch of baboons kind of chilling out in the hot spring. And uh, hot springs are really important in Winterfell that I'll discuss later on. So, uh, so what are the facts of Winterfell? Uh, and, and these are basically just statements and observations taken from the book uh, itself. First of all, that uh, Winterfell is a very large castle. Obviously, it's located in the center of the north, as shown by this little star here. And it was built roughly 8,000 years before the events of the Game of Thrones. Uh, that's basically at the, at the beginning of the Age of Heroes, if you will, or at the end of the... Uh, at the end of the long night. Uh, it's basically protected by two massive walls. Uh, upper right hand corner shows kind of like a motto of Winterfell. You basically got a, an, an outer wall composed of granite and an inner wall composed of something called a gray rock. And, and, and we'll get into the, basically the origins of the gray rock as well as the granite and how it kind of fits into the geologic models and how they form. Uh, basically this a second observation is that, you know, there are winding tombs below the castle, you know, we call them the, the Crypts of Winterfell. And lastly, uh, Winterfell, the castle itself, is situated atop hot springs that keep the castle warm even in winter. So there's some kind of, basically, a plumbing system that Winterhell, Winterfell has that basically takes advantage of the uh, hot circling waters that keep the walls heated up and the floors probably heated up as well. Uh, during the winter time, making it a pretty nice place to live, even if the rest of the north is uh, pretty cold. Um, and you kind of see a little pond here, and that's in here. That pond is actually not a hot spring. Uh, it was actually described in the books. I think the first Caitlin or the first uh, Ned chapter that describes this. But I just like the picture of it because it's pretty. And then, you know, we saw the same scene. In episode one, season one, and of course for scale, you have the village idiot in the background who should remain nameless, but we all know who that village idiot is. So uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the granites first. Uh, granite is a type of rock that's uh, that's very coarse gray, meaning that there's really coarse crystals in it. Uh, everybody's familiar with granite because you know modern day kitchens tend to have granite countertops in it, so everyone knows what it looks like. Uh, essentially, uh, if you remember back in the uh, theme of Valeria talk, I came up talking about the subduction plate model, right? Where in a subduction zone, you have basically an oceanic plate that basically slides underneath uh, another high, lower density plate called the continental crust. So you basically have a, a, le a, a lesser dense oceanic crust basically subducting underneath a lesser, sorry, a higher density oceanic crust sliding underneath a uh, lesser density, uh, lower density continental crust. And basically what happens is that the, uh, the oceanic crust melts as it gets down deeper. Then basically the fluids and stuff that melt actually 
rises up, okay, so puts low density versus the uh, surrounding rocks, and then basically fall from these volcanoes. Granites are granites are actually called intrusive because they don't form outside of the Earth's surface. Like a a volcano will blow up blow up ash and everything else. Uh, that that's referred to as um, an extrusive igneous rock, right? It's like the it's like when you pop a pimple, all that shit that comes out is extrusive, right? <laughs> to put it, uh, put it mildly. Uh, intrusive rocks are actually formed uh, in the subsurface where it it doesn't cool as fast. And because it doesn't cool off as fast, it actually builds bigger crystals in a rock. And uh, how it forms is basically, look at the, uh, the slide in the upper right. It basically gets, they actually get uh, exposed by erosion. So you basically have uh, magma rising up, it cools and solidifies, okay? And then, you know, over time, right, all the, all the overlying layers will get eroded off and basically you expose this big piece of cold, uh, you know, slowly cooled, large crystal uh, rock and uh, that's called granite, okay? Uh, the Sierra Nevada in um, in California, if you're familiar with that mountain range, there is one big gigantic granite pluton or batholith as well. So those mountains, they're solid granite and it's basically been exposed over time. Uh, those things formed like 260, 270 million years ago. So uh, that's what that's, that's what granites are essentially and how they form. Now, uh, so. So what, what can we gain from this in terms of Winterfell itself? Well, they have granite there, so we know that granite must have been close by because I searched it out 8,000 years ago that there was some sort of transportation system, you know, like a, you know, like any kind of trucker union or railroads that basically bought sourced granite from, you know, far away. So they probably had to go close by. They found some granite basically made a quarry out of it and basically dragged the hunks of granite to Winterfell to build a wall. And uh, the nearest mountain range we have are, are basically the uh, the nearby Black Mountains that we see to the north. Is uh, essentially, it basically spans from the uh, the Wolf's Wood up north into the uh, Beyond the Wall. It's a big, uh, big mountain range that you've seen in other maps. and. Uh, you can see the pictures of the granite itself. I mean, not all granites look alike, but you have a close-up here of the of kind of like the fabric of the rock and then, you know, what it's used for to build walls. That's an example of a granite wall. Okay, so let's get into my favorite thing, which is which are limestones. Uh, so the limestones is uh, what I think is the gray rock that everybody talks about uh, when describing the inner walls of um, Winterfell. And basically, it's kind of the same story as granite, right? It must have been a source very close by because of the lack of transportation. But the cool thing about the uh, limestones is that, you know, these limestones are actually biochemical chem sedimentary rocks, meaning that are, they are formed by living organisms, right? And uh, here's a little map of kind of like the carbon cycle. You basically shoot a bunch of CO2 up into the air. Then the CO2 basically forms into carbonic acid. It falls down, rains down to the ocean, okay, and then it gets it gets mixed around in the ocean. Organisms such as clams, you know, sea snails, you know, any kind of crustaceans will actually absorb this this carbonate material and basically build shells out of it, out of calcium carbonate. And then when they die off, all you're left with is you know the shell die. The, the actual organism gets chewed up and eaten up, right? The flesh, and all you're left with is basically shells. So essentially, that's what limestone is. It's formed by various shell fragments of various sizes. It can be very microscopic in nature because you know, you know, no, no, it's not just sea snails that <laughs> or crabs or whatever that you form these calcium carbonate shells or, or coral reefs is another thing. I mean, it could be really fine, really microscopic creatures that actually use this to uh, secrete the calcium carbonate in the making shells. Um, Anyway, in order to actually create this stuff, it, the stuff, the basically the water can't be dirty, right? Because every time you go into, uh, every time you see find coral reefs, you know it tends to be very, very clean blue waters, or you don't find coral reefs or any kind of carbon, uh, massive carbonate communities. 
um, you know, in really dirty water, say like the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, you have, you have little patch reefs, but you don't have these big, massive reef builders, sort of like what you have in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. So it really does require a very clean water, otherwise the organisms will just die out, right? It's just too dirty. And it needs to be pretty shallow because it also needs light, right? In order for coral reefs and to grow, you're going to need, you know, very shallow water and a lot of light, right? Required for the photosynthesis of these organisms. Um, they also, these limestones, the classical limestones also form, you know, basically in warmer temperatures uh, with a specific pH range. Uh, and usually, if you look in the map in the upper right hand corner, it's generally between 30 uh, 30 north and south latitudes in the ocean in the world so you kind of see that little pink band here in the uh, in the upper right hand corner uh, where you see a lot of these large carbonate reefs and you know being developed okay you don't see much stuff because otherwise it's either too dirty or it's just really too cold or the water is just really too acidic okay uh, you know there there are there are things called carbonate marl stones that basically can accumulate in deep water as fine grain calcareous ooze. But uh, I mean, those, those those are classically defined as quote unquote limestones. Okay, they can be called marl stones if you will. Uh, anyway, so the, the getting back to what Winterfell is, you know, the carbonate cement sediments themselves commonly produce uh, gray colored rocks. So um, you know, perhaps, you know, the gray stone that make up the majority of wonderful structures are these kind of, you know, fine-grained gray rocks, if you will. You know, a lot of times when you go into the, uh, go to, if you're hiking around any national forest region, you know, climbing up rocks, uh, you, you probably see a lot of stuff that looks kind of beige kind of reddish. A lot of that is probably sandstones because they contain a lot more iron. But a lot of the gray stuff that you see, especially the ones that are really, you know, if it's not shale or anything like that, if you see fossils in them, if you see kind of like, you know, shell fragments or whatever, you know, or they, uh, they tend to be more limestones. And, and a way to figure out what a limestone versus a shale is, basically, all you need to do is just drop some hydrochloric acid on it. And if it fizzes, if it fizzes then it contains a lot of uh, carbonate. So, uh, anyway, uh, so here's another example of a wall that's in uh, Dublin, Ireland, and uh, that one's made out of limestone. Pretty cool. So uh, any questions about the rocks before I move on to something, some other stuff about Winterfell? No, I just think that's really cool about the Greystone, and uh, mm -hmm. it's very interesting topic. I'm just kind of lost in all this knowledge right now, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. As you go further on, you can uh, I'll I'll summarize and I'll integrate everything. You kind of everything comes together at the end. But 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 just remember that you know keep that subduction model in mind because it's really important when we, when you kind of when we try to reconstruct the kind of the history of the area and what things are doing on a big scale. So uh, the second observation that we have are these winding tombs underneath uh, Winterfell. And what exactly are, what exactly are they? All right, well, um, you know, if we, if we have a carbonate environment, okay, as it gets exposed, what happens is that we, we get this process called karsting. And you see this quite a lot in the United States, especially in Florida. You get, you basically, you develop these sinkholes, which are basically dissolved limestone right because once once you have a um, once you have fresh water intruding onto a calcium carbonate rock system you, you're basically going to dissolve it essentially because uh, you know it's too acidic for the rock and uh, this karst topography manifests itself like in this kind of like the swiss cheese geology uh you know where you have surface water intruding into it and forming these very complex cave systems and a good example of that is like Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico. That's basically a, uh, a type of system where the carbonate, the limestone itself basically are, is being continuously dissolved, forming these caves due to the influx of uh, meteoric fresh water. 
And you look at that map in the U.S., you can see there's a lot of areas where we have the system, these systems in place, and they can, and they can wreak a lot of havoc, right? It causes basically big sinkholes, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so generally they're, they're, they're formed, you know, in dom predominantly uh, limestone type of environments or where you have the limestone basement, if you will. And uh, the thing about karsting too is that it initiates once limestone is exposed to fresh waters, okay? Because limestone forms in the, on basically ocean water. But once you get fresh water circulating through the system, you're going to start to dissolve the rocks and basically develop these caves. And, you know, and, and, it, and an idea is that, you know, we see all these caves and winding tombs in Winterfell. You know, we know that there has to be some limestone close by for them to build walls. Perhaps Winterfell is sitting on basically on karst topography. And here's an example of a kind of a cliff here where you kind of see this kind of network of caves in cross section in, on the face of the cliff. And perhaps, you know, Winterfell may be sitting on top of it and the things below it are what we call the crypts of Winterfell, these big, massive, winding cave systems in there. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's an idea and it could be supported by what we know of basically uh, the rocks and the carbonate environment that, you know, we're basically sitting on limestone essentially and these caves are still actively uh, growing, if you will, and they extend down for probably hundreds of feet. And uh, and no, I don't know if there's a dragon living in these caves because that's one of the theories floating out there is that there's what happened. The, the, the story goes that when Prince, you know, Jocerys Targaryen went to Winterfell to basically ask the Starks for aid during the Dance of Dragons. His dragon, Vermax, basically went one of these caves and, lit a, and basically laid a clutch of eggs. Okay, one of the eggs hatched and now there's a dragon. They're heating up the waters, <laughs> circulating you know, in the caves, and that's the source of your, essentially, your, uh, your hot springs, if you will. What uh, well, dragon heat? Uh, rats, maybe? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, rats. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. People throw these theories and, you know, I, you know, without any real proof. But, you know, it, it sounds neat, right, that there's a dragon down there that's basically warming up the waters. But realistically, is it possible? Probably not. I mean, I, I wasn't joking when I was asking if there was a volcano under Winterfell, but you're kind of blowing me to pieces here. This, this is... <laughs> okay. Very, yeah. uh, well, the, the only thing I can say is that there is definitely a network of caves because that's been observed in the books, caverns, and then we have a natural process that can develop these networks, network of caves underground. Okay, we're in the right environment, we have the right kind of rocks, you know. Boom, you can have caves. And, and, the, and, the, th and the thing about uh, karsting is that it can extend for hundreds of miles, but I'll get, I'll get to that in the next session. Because uh, you can see in the map, right? I mean, we can go thousands of miles with these networks, and, you know. It, it, it's a really widespread event, you know, especially if the carbonate formation is very, uh, the original carbonate formation or limestone formation is um, extensive. All right, so last observation are the hot springs themselves, okay? And, and, the, and the hot springs themselves is like one of the things that everybody wants to theorize about. You know, what's causing the hot springs, blah, blah, blah. Well, naturally, how they, what I wanted to discuss is how they occur naturally and what we know can create hot springs, okay? So basically, hot springs can form when basically, the, when we have these surface faults, okay, these faults breaking through the subsurface, okay, being exposed on the land. And then you have rainwaters or any kind of fresh water, say from rivers or from rain, coming in. And it basically goes down these faults, okay. These, these are really deep-seated faults, okay. And basically it circulates and then it hits a permeable layer, like a sandstone or whatever. And then it circulates in that permeable layer, a deep permeable layer that's very close to a heat source, say it's magma or whatever, okay? The, the basically, the water then basically heats up, 
and then warm water will start to rise and it'll go up through fissures or natural cracks in the rocks to form these hot springs. So if it's a very, you know, complicated, convoluted kind of network for slow, you know, very low permeabilities, uh, basically, you basically get accumulations in the surface as hot springs. If it's a really big, thick conduit that's very close by to the heat source, you get these things called geysers, right? A, a good example of a geyser would be things that you see, uh, Old Faithful in Yellowstone Park. It's a, it's a geyser, if you will, and it's full of hot water, okay? Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a volcano down there. It could just be a deep-seated fault that's very close to a heat source, okay? Might have been a volcano down there, Okay, but it doesn't mean that it's a classical volcano because classical volcanoes are things that are either expressed on the surface of the earth or say underneath water, right? Or, or at the surface of the, of the water bottom, okay? So, I mean, it's just a very close, it's just a very shallow heat source, if you will. Um, the Hawaii, uh, this nice example of a hot spring that you see on the surface, right? This is a little, little accumulation. Okay, look, it even looks like a little caldera, if you kind of look at it closely, uh, from the Dumavirla area talk. And also, you also get these hot springs, you know, that's you know, forming in these little cave systems, especially in, the, in this karst topography. You can get local accumulations of warm water. Okay, like you kind of see like these little caves in here that could serve as, you know, that can be uh, trapped, we're going to have trapped hot water, if you will. And uh, this is the, uh, I can't even pronounce it, Gortagia hot spring in Iceland, and, and this is where actually that uh, that scene where uh, Greta and uh, Jon Snow first made love in um, was filmed. So you no, know, it's really beautiful, you no know, really nice clean water. Luckily, um, there wasn't a lot of sulfur in it because a lot of, it, a lot of these hot springs have sulfur and it's, it could be really deadly to you. So uh, John and you, you Greta got lucky in this one. <laughs> just, just, just a fact, you know, it could be pretty poisonous waters. <laughs> so, uh, in the arms of the love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's lucky that they didn't, they didn't dissolve or anything like that <laughs> in the waters. Uh, so, you know, it, to me, is I really doubt that there's actually a vac an active volcano in Winterfell because it would have been observed, you know, by seismicity. Okay, so there, there's no earthquakes being described around inter Winterfell, right? An active volcano would have a lot, would be associated with a lot of seismic, seismic activity. That's from the Doom Blair talk from last week. So you would see earthquakes all over the place. Those things are never described in the books. You, you would see, potentially, you would see a lot of dragon glass, a lot of obsidian being extruded. Okay, you don't see that near Winterfell. Okay. You might have stored caches of, of dragon glass material that the choice of the forest or wherever, you know, could have stashed there, but we, there are no natural deposits of dragon glass. What you, where you do see the natural deposits of dragon glass is in Dragonstone. And that isn't been described as a natural volcano, an active volcano. Okay, so, so there's nothing in the books that says that, okay, and there's no description that says that. I mean, what you can say is that there, you know, there could be a shallow heat source. Okay. Right. I'll take that. Yeah. All right. And you guys can prove me wrong if you want to, but you know, I'm just going by how, going by what we know of how these hot springs form. And again, these hot springs form can form, you know, can be sourced that could be originate hundreds of miles away. Okay, you don't necessarily need to have the heat source right underneath the place where the hot springs are. But all it takes is water coming in from 500 miles away, being basically being heated up 300 miles away, and basically traveling through these permeable sandstone layers and then coming up through natural fissures in the, sur in the subsurface. All right, any, any questions on the, uh, any questions on the, uh, Hot springs before I head on to like kind of like the big scale stuff because this is the stuff that I'm the most interested in. Uh, interested in on now. I'm just like to say I'm really okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Okay, so so the big picture, okay, and and what I like about this is that now we're trying to reconstruct what, what actually happened at Winterfell and uh, what's going on in terms of timing, because timing, again, is really, really important when trying to understand physical processes and what actually, and what could be realistic and what cannot, and what isn't realistic, okay? Uh, essentially, uh, here's a map of present-day Westeros, okay? We have these black mountains right here, okay, that, you know, I was talking about could be the source of the granite, okay? We have Winterfell at the foot of the, uh, the black mountains, Okay, you got the wolf's wood right there. All right, uh, basically you have, you have King's Landing about 700 or 1,000, 1,500 miles away or whatever it is. Okay, number in our platonics figure, right, we had a spreading zone that basically separates the uh, the uh, Essos from Westeros, right, along the narrow sea, if you will. And uh, we have the wall, okay. now. Now, in terms of the actual observations in the books, besides on what George R. Martin has stated, he, he has stated that the wall is about 100 leagues long, okay, that roughly equivalent is about 300 miles long, okay? So, right there's about 300 miles, that the length of that black bar. Now, assuming that there's a one-to-one -one scale on it, that means the length of the wall between, uh, the, uh, the length of Westeros, assuming one to one, is roughly about three thousand miles. So you basically flip flip that black bar vertically, and just basically count how many three hundred mile long bars gets from the wall to Dorne, southernmost Dorne. So basically, so it basically stretches, you know, from about three thousand miles from north to south, and then at the widest point of Westeros, you know, it's about nine hundred miles at the widest point east to west. So now, now we have a concept of scale and distance, right? Now, in terms of uh, in terms of the other features, so on Earth, right? We know that deserts appear within a general latitude range, roughly between thirty degree north and thirty degree south latitude. Uh, thirty, thirty, you know, basically the Sahara is the northern kind of a within the 30 degree north band from the equator and, and basically the Atacama Desert in South America is between zero and 30 degrees south, right? So present day Dorne, we know, is full of deserts, right? Because that's been described in the books, it's full of deserts. So now, so now we can pin that latitude roughly at about 30 degrees, assuming that, you know, assuming that the relationships still hold true to Earth, like they are in Planetos, that, you know, on Planetos, Deserts form roughly around those same similar latitudes as Earth does. Okay, so we pinned it down there now. Now, uh, the second anchor point that we have is we know that the ice wall has been there for millennia, thousands of years, right? So if it was, if it was in a more temperate environment, that wouldn't that thing melt, <laughs> right? So, so since it's been there for ages, and assuming that there's no magic involved to keeping it frozen. Okay, that that we can we can probably suggest that you know it's probably in a permanently kind of frozen environment or or a permanently cold environment, if you will. Right, the north is also described as being bitterly cold, so you can kind of maybe put that put the latitude of the of the wall roughly around close to what the present day Arctic Circle is on the Earth. Okay, it's permanently frozen, a lot of tundra, you know, the North's full of tundra, right? And uh, so that's roughly about 66, okay, 0.5 degrees North latitude, okay? Okay, so basically what, what it means here is that, you know, if you just kind of, if you just kind of take, take our scales now and just kind of, and kind of basically look, you can kind of actually estimate what the length of, you know, what, how much, how much variation of latitude that you have uh, going from the wall to Dorne. And, you know, and it's about, you know, 3,500 miles north of variation. 3,500 miles of variation. So, so, now I'm going to kind of step back here and talk about the whole idea about limestone now and Winterfell. We know that limestone also forms roughly, you know, between 30 north and 30 south latitude. Okay, so at one point, Lime's Winterfell must have sat somewhere along the 30 degree north latitude line. Okay, but now, 
Okay, but now, since, since you know that that's very close to the wall, at 66 degree latitude, it's, it's actually been shoved up, right? And now it's only 1,500 miles away from the wall, okay? Or 700 miles away from the wall, or I forgot what the actual number was. So it needs to sit roughly about 60 degree latitude, okay? So um, so if you just kind of take a ruler here and kind of measure the distance of how, of how much distance it must have migrated, north, how, how much distance the, the winter fell site must have migrated from time of deposition no deposition of the limestones to where it currently sits right now we're looking at about 2700 miles okay yeah it's really tough to uh it's really tough for this to sink in here but i guess the, i guess the picture is that you know you know based on what we know of the rocks the evidence okay we kind we can kind of uh reconstruct where winterfall sat you know when the limestone's formed relative to where what it is now and how much it's moved. Okay, the distance that it moved, which is roughly about 2,700 miles. How many, I don't know, one of those years, how many years would it take for something like that to occur around about? Next slide. Uh, the next slide, I'll show you. I mean, <laughs> see, it's a big story now. Okay, now. Now, let, 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 let's talk about rape now, right? Because everybody's interested in rape because rape basically uh, impacts the time, right? The time is basically dependent on the rate of movement. Uh, so, so if we, if we went ahead here and just kind of looked at kind of like our different models here, I think the first thing that, that you see is that, the first thing is that, is that we had shallow seas and deposition of limestones around Winterfell some time ago. I don't know how much time ago, but we did have that. And that, that was in order to create the limestone. So we know that Winterfell must have been near 30 degree north latitude or somewhere within 30 and 30 degree north and south latitude. Okay. We know that there's granite there. Okay. We know that, you know, there's a good source of granite in these big volcanoes these big mountains that you see very close by. Okay. And in order to create these kind of mountain ranges, you're going to need some kind of subduction zone model, right? That we always talk about that. I've been showing everybody for the past week and a half, past week, right? So if you can picture a subduction zone happening between two different land masses, okay, one's in, so I, I kind of drew this little uh, chaos symbol showing you know, where people think the location of uh, King's Landing is versus the location of Winterfell. What you, what you can have is that you have an overall northern migration of these two land masses, okay? But then this King's Landing is kind of sitting on the oceanic plate and it's basically being subducted underneath the Winterfell plate, which is this. Okay, that's what happens that you form these mountain ranges right behind the subduction zone, which is what these uh, black mountains are represent, and that's where you get the that's where you get the granite. So, um, so anyway, so in terms of how how fast they're moving, well, well, we we know that it takes about present day plates or roughly one to two inches per year. Okay, uh, I don't know where the rates were the same back then, but, but say say they were the same back then. Okay, what, what that means is that it moves about a mile every 63,000 63, years. We do the math, okay? And we know that the distance from winter, the distance from the old Winterfell where we were depositing limestones to the present day location of Winterfell was 2,700 miles. You just basically multiply 63,000 times 2,700 miles. And, I'll, and that'll, that'll give you a time it takes. And, that, and that's what you get here. I mean, so basically, I did the little calculations. Basically, for all this stuff to move from Winterfell to go from roughly 30 degree north latitude to about now 60 degree north latitude, okay, that's roughly about 171 million years. So it's a very slow process, right? It's, it's not like, you know, you had this big catastrophe to all of a sudden reshuffle the plates around. Uh, we, don't, we don't see that anywhere. So, <laughs> and if it did happen, you know, there'll be nobody left alive to actually tell the story. Uh, so, 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 so basically, the, the whole process take, 
took about 171 million years. Uh, it could it could take longer, so it could be moving right now. You know, it could have stopped. You know, after 171 million years, and then it just kind of stayed still. Uh, you know, until the present day. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but but what, what we do know, what we do know is that you know we we, we got the rocks. We know that from the time of deposition of limestone to the emplacement of the granite, where the two continents probably collided and then it actually moved close to the present day, uh, where and where Winterfell moved to the present present day location on Westeros, it took about 171 million years. Okay, now at that point, you know. You know when when the granite actually formed. You know it was still kind of one big landmass around. You know uh, that Westeros was connected to uh, connected to Essos. Now uh, it might have only took like another twenty five or fifty million years now to basically separate out. And basically, what happens here is that you kind of form a spreading ridge now, and now you have King's Landing, uh, Westeros, and Essos being basically pulled apart. By this uh, spreading zone, basically creating the narrow sea, and you can see that there's not much time. Uh, there's probably not much time involved between the placement of granite and the and where the present day uh, present day Winterfell is, because it's only moving maybe about you know 500 maybe about 500 miles north. So we're right here relative to 60 degree north. Now we're sitting at 60 degree north there. So I mean 500 miles, you know that's maybe about. 15 million years, roughly, or whatever. It doesn't sound like a lot of time, but, um, you know, there is. Yeah. That's all I'll say about it. That's all I'll say about that. So, uh, I hope that helps. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of like what I think is going on, you know, in terms of, you get this limestone. We know that there's limestone there. We know that there's granite there. We know that limestones form in certain areas of the world. We know that we know how granite forms. Um, you know, and uh, I guess my last point was that you know what once these limestones are actually exposed to fresh water, okay, then you get the onset of karsting. So the karsting could have been formed hundreds, of, like a hundred million years ago, or whatever, it, during phase two, right, the middle picture. And it still could be going on right now, and you know, my, and then th this is where you start getting things such as you know water circulating through the system, getting getting heated up by some sort of shallow magma source or shallow heat source, and then you get the hot springs forming. That's the, oh. that's no math right there. <laughs> so it's pretty much like it's kind of a slow moving, yeah, plastic, and that's why it's not a, a lot of geological activity, but. There's enough there to cause a hot spring or somewhere close by, right? I mean, there there is some type of heat source around around that area. It doesn't necessarily have to be at Winterfell. I mean, Dragonstone's roughly around there, somewhere about fifteen hundred miles away, right? And 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 that's our best evidence of a volcano, right? We, that's what's described in the books. Dragonstone has these big blowing you know, glowing, smoky uh, mountains. Okay, and, and that's where we have a the occurrence of naturally occurring dragon glass, which is basically, you know, volcanic glass, right? Very, uh, very rapidly cooled volcanic material which will basically cause uh, dragon glass to form. So somehow in here, in this area here, if there's, you know, enough permeable, enough permeable rock enough faulting, enough cracks, enough fresh water, and a good enough and a good enough permeable reservoir to actually for the water to flow through, get close enough to the heat source and then circulate back up to Winterfell, you can do it. Yeah, I can I can see that. Yeah. But yeah, but it, it's very it's very it's very hard to throw around the term active volcano because again, we don't see any evidence of that active volcanic activity. We see no earthquakes. We don't hear about any earthquakes happening in Winterfell. We don't see, or it hasn't been described, any natural occurrence of dragon glass around Winterfell. Okay, so where is the active volcano? Yeah, I mean, they did find it above the wall, but it was buried, so it wasn't a natural spot. Where it, exactly. Found. Yeah, 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 yeah. The children, the first, or or the is the fist, of, is the fist of the first men, right? The first men went up there with a bunch of dragon glass. 
weapons, right? He's basically just buried it north of the walls. It wasn't naturally occurring. Yeah, so that's... So... The volcano from Dragonstone could be affecting uh, Winterfell, you're saying, right? Well, I'm sure. saying it's very tough because it's like 1,500 miles away. <laughs> but yeah, but, but, yeah but, but some it could. It could affect it. If there's a... If there's a network of magma, you know, of shallow magma somewhere in the subsurface that you actually have these, where you actually have these circulating fresh waters getting close to getting heated up and basically going back into Winterfell 1,500 miles away, it could. Uh, but, you know, just because there's a shallow source of magma does not mean that there's a volcano there, okay? I guess that's my, that, that's the bottom line. You, you can have very... You, you can have very deep faults that basically reach, you know, reach a magma source or reach a heated source, if you will, okay? Or any kind of source that basically emits heat. The waters will pass over top of it, get heated up, and then basically circulate back up through cracks and or other faults. Almost maybe like a vein of magma yeah. or something? Yeah, sure. it could be anything. I mean, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I don't doubt that I don't doubt that there could be some magmatic activity close to this, close to the close to the uh, surface, sort of like at Yellowstone, right? A, a, a Yellowstone National Park, right? I mean, as I was showing in the last slide pack, in the last in the talk, right? You have these, you have these, you have this chain of volcanoes, right? That erupted 16 million years ago in the first, and then it's continue, it's basically migrating to the north, forming a chain. You can have extant extant calderas being formed, you know, that have act, that has access to uh, basically hot magma, and uh, if the waters get close enough to it, it's like you know, if the if the water is passing through the top of it, you know, through these permeable layers, are close enough to it, they will get heated, and then the waters will just kind of flow up uh, into the you know flow up onto the surface around Winterfell. But you know, again. An active volcano is, is tough to do. I mean, you, you would need like a lot of these extant volcanic, extant volcanoes or ancient volcanoes, you know, that's still yeah. somehow connected to a heated, still, that, that, that's still connected to a magma source. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jack, I got nothing, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so, 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 so now we have timing and we have kind of like a model now. Um, but this, this is my last slide, guys, and it basically tries to integrate everything, everything together here. So uh, we got the Northern Mountains, okay, great source for granite. Okay, we got hot springs occurring around Winterfell. We got karsting underneath Winterfell, okay, aka the tombs. And this whole area, you no know, south of Winterfell or all around it, has you no know, was probably a source of limestone from from you know way back, and you probably have you know, these limestone quarries probably being built where they actually got the limestone from to actually make a lot of Winterfell to construct the uh, walls of Winterfell, the inner walls, the uh, outer walls, which probably from granite from the uh, from the Northern Mountains or the Black Mountains, if you will. So it's, everything's in proximity to one another. That's right. Um, yeah, and you know the caves underneath the Winterfells can be ex explained by you know by by the expected subsurface limestone and karst process, right? Because we know that's probably underlain by limestone because we have a lot of limestone around there, and it's being exposed to fresh water right now. A bunch of rivers, right? All the water is percolating downward. Okay, you get a lot of rain. It's being exposed to a lot of freshwater rain. And, you know, and these hot springs, you know, are probably due to some sort of superheated waters coming up through fracture systems. And these, you know, these could be very deep, deep-seated fracture systems that are getting close to a heat source and basically just circulating up. Yeah, not to mention the massive snow melt that they must have after each winter. You know, that would be a lot of water going down, flowing through the... Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, good point. I mean, I'm not exactly, I'm not exactly sure what the elevation change from north to south is, but 
It could happen. Yeah, yeah because we, we definitely would need a gradient. But yeah. A pop, yeah, a positive, a negative gradient. That's kind of a shy. Oh. I don't know anything about botany. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> that was a question from John St. Baptiste. I, I don't know if uh, you would know or not that I figured out that. Nah, uh, I know nothing. John's know about botany. So. I'll ask you have one other question. Do you know any uh, real cities that are along the same parallel that Winterfell is? What is it, the six parallel? Uh, let's. Let's try to see something here. Because it could... No, I don't have a good map, unfortunately. Uh, well, Bravo's at 50. Maybe Ib? I think he was talking about all the real world, um, yeah. like uh, historical sites, possibly. You know oh, I mean? oh, you mean the real world? Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, okay. okay that, that's an easier question. Okay, <laughs> let's take a look here. So 60 is this line right there, okay? See, can I see this dash right there? See my cursor? That's 60 degree north right there. Right, we've got 30 and then we've got 60. So, um, I don't know, Anchorage perhaps? <laughs> Could be one. Uh, in Norway, or Oslo perhaps? I don't know, maybe... I know. So let's go this way here. The northern tip of Japan, perhaps. Siberia, definitely. The main race of people, ancient people, that I can think of would be probably the Nordic people mm -hmm. at that. Well, I, I'm trying to think of other, uh, maybe Tibetan and. Uh, other native, well, I don't know if Tibet's lower than that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, Tibet's down, down roughly yeah. in, in this latitude here. But you know, I mean, I mean lat latitude isn't the only factor for, for weather, right? Like you have predominant winds and everything else. You know, where, you know, that's one factor. Another factor is the natural terrain. You know, we're not your sheltered, we're not, you know. Even ocean currents play wrong weather. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There's a cold strip and hot water. Mm -hmm. I think we went over that right here. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know if you want to. Can You can't see the check, can you? Uh, I'm looking at chat right now. Is there a question? Yeah, Connie Super is asking about the cold crypts, hot walls, and the springs, and asking why. But um, well, yeah, I mean, in terms of the cold crypts, cold crypts, uh, go go take a field trip to a Carlsbad Cavern. It's pretty darn cold in there. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, I mean, there aren't any. You know, you might have some hot springs in these in the waters themselves, but the overall environment, since we're underneath the ground, right, or under the ground, underground, it gets pretty cold as you get deeper and deeper, right, underground, from the sunlight. Hot walls, go ask Brandon Builder, it wouldn't surprise me if he basically devised a plumbing system to leverage the hot springs, and that way, that was able to circulate um, through Winterfell. Hell, the Romans did it, so, and if Brandon Builder is as cool as we think he is, then I don't see why he can do it. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I, it's always magic. Yeah, or it could be magic. <laughs> you know, it's probably why it only took him a couple of years probably to build it. Or I, I don't know how long it took him. I'm just kidding. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was a composite character, like many historical yeah. figures yeah. today. Yeah, it could be. Seems to hint at that at all the brand. Yeah, names. you know, and, and the crypts were the crypts are not built right before they pump water through the walls. Right, the crypts are naturally forming, so nobody's building them. Right, they're actually forming naturally. So, you got any got anything, Mackenzie? Um. Well, 
Not really, because it's like so engrossed in like conversation. Um, but yeah, so we can kind of dispel the dragon theory a little bit, I guess. Um, and I guess this is not really for this topic, but it's like we can do like a thing, I guess, for the eerie and how that like how I guess that sort of thing makes sense, like the sky cells and all of that, like how they can build that as well and um like how that structure even makes sense because it's like such on a small like in the shell anyways it's on like a small bit of like rock because it's like been like carved out i guess i don't know if i'm talking nonsense or i mean milk makes us all look bad no no, no i mean uh, i i don't know how the area was built here's a little slide here showing that uh the present day, the, the present day uh, geography, if you will, of a uh, of Westeros. So in that right hand slide there, so basically you have that crescent, right? So that's the mountains of the moon, right? Shape, shape look like a crescent. Okay, and the area is probably built somewhere, you know, somewhere at the base of one of these mountains. Um, Oh, I mean, they, they, they build castles in, you know, I think there are some castles in Switzerland that are very close to their house. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think the area is like a, on top of a mountain, right? But it could be like in, in a pass or like in a little valley, you know, in between mountains, but still relatively high up in elevation versus the uh, low lying lands. Right, so so you could have valleys up there, right behind the uh, right along the crescent, right, right along the uh, mountains of the moons, if you will, and then relative to the actual veil part of the veil, which is in this little green area, right, which is the actual valley, you know, you could have like these mini valleys where they were able to build mountains. That's I don't know that's, that's just an idea. I mean, it makes sense. It makes. Sense. It's hard to know because we see what we see in the show, but the books, we get a certain description, but it's hard to know exactly mm -hmm. what's on there because you don't get as much of a description of the Eerie as you do, say, Winterfell or other places. You, you just. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm going to ask anybody in the chat have any questions for Milt while we have him here. Um, I know Milt might want to say a few more things, maybe? Or you oh, no, I, no, I'm done. I'm done with this stuff. <laughs> it's dropping the mic and out. <laughs> I, I, mean, there, I mean, there's nothing more to say about Winterfell. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, one man's opinion, basically referencing other people's work and basically integrating some of the physical processes that we know on Earth right now, especially the rocks. It makes a lot of sense, and you know, even if you're completely wrong, I learned a lot about geology. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there, I mean there, we can at least explain it with natural processes as opposed to uh, making a theory without any kind of support material or kind of working backwards and trying to make the observations fit your hypotheses. And uh, if the observations are uninformed or wrong, then it's uh, kind of a waste of time. So anyway, <laughs> well, I've did it before. I think it's a natural thing for people to do sometimes. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. Something you got to teach yourself not to do because exactly. it's, it's exactly. up to every human mm -hmm. to to want to make what you believe right, right, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with that. 